I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. I thought I was dead, for sure. Like, guaranteed dead. An explosion inside a New Brunswick refinery sent flames shooting 30 meters into the air and contractors running for their lives. We'll bring you the story from inside the refinery, how one man managed to escape. Also tonight, why the limo in that New York State crash never should have been on the road. And is Apple pressuring you to buy new products instead of just fixing the ones you have? We go in-depth to investigate the tactics that could be costing you and the movement to give consumers the right to repair. This is The National. A hissing sound ever so brief was all the warning workers had at the Irving oil refinery today. In an instant, part of the St. John facility was engulfed in fire just moments after an explosion. I felt the house shake. We thought like something hit the house. It rattled the window so bad. And I come up and there was a great big plume of black smoke, like a mushroom cloud, just over the trees over here. More than 2,000 workers were inside the facility rushing to get out as firefighters and emergency crews rushed in to fight the flames. The refinery is less than five kilometers from the city center and surrounded by residential neighborhoods, the closest homes just a few hundred meters away. Neighbors watching in horror, and as Kayla Hounsell tells us, from inside the refinery, it was even more frightening. It's like they're not getting it under control. It's getting, it's getting worse. Employees inside the plant felt the explosion before they saw it. We got blasted to the ground. Everything blew up and I didn't know what to do. Jonathan Wright is a contractor at the refinery. He was working just meters from the blast. The heat kept him from the stairs to get down. I had to grab on the scaffold poles and hang down so I can jump to the next level because there's no ladders. When he reached the ground, he fled the property. I ran the whole entire way out of there. I've seen refineries fires and they're terrible. He wasn't the only one running. You could see uh, just herds of workers in their blue uh, coveralls just evacuating the, like, crossing the street, evacuating the uh, premises. And, uh, and one of them came by in a truck in his overalls and said, get out of here. Many who live close to the refinery fled too. They say they know the risk. We're in what they call the red zone. So if all else fails and that place did go, we're done. Irving Oil says the explosion and subsequent fire occurred when a diesel treating unit malfunctioned. That's where they removed sulfur from diesel fuel. But the company says it's too early to say what caused the problem. We have to understand what caused it and make sure we, we've uh, isolated that incident before we do anything moving forward in the operation. The facility is the largest refinery in Canada, capable of producing more than 320,000 barrels per day. It's unclear how long the refinery will be shut down and what impact that might have on customers in Canada and the United States. It's Thanksgiving uh, weekend. The fact that um, no one was hurt uh, seriously or killed during this incident, I think, is, a, is something to be very thankful for. At least four people were taken to hospital. Jonathan Wright injured his hand, knee and foot. He says he's not going back to work. That could have killed so many people, including myself, so I'm pretty upset about it. He plans to fly home to Florida tomorrow. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, St. John. And we want to play you some more of Kayla's interview with Jonathan Wright, his story of being inside that refinery and seeing the explosion firsthand. Tonight, he's our witness. I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. I thought I was dead, for sure. Like, guaranteed dead. So I was working, and we were just sitting around. I was talking with the other technician, and then that's when the explosion happened, and then... Everything just turned orange. I mean, you felt the heat on your face and everything, and smoke started coming in, and we just had to get the hell out of there, but it was really bad. The swinging through scaffold poles, and we're walking up across pipes and everything to get out of there, it was terrible, but I just didn't want to get burned, you know. I completely left the plant. Some of my coworkers stayed, and I, I just didn't want to be there, you know, so I got out of there, and then these people were driving, and they made a U-turn. There was two old ladies that were in a car. I just jumped in with them. I'm not going to go back to the work in there, period. I'm going to go home and uh, get my wrist checked out and everything. So that's it, you're done? Yeah, I'm going to fly home. Here's a look at what else we're working on tonight. A new twist in the disappearance of the head of Interpol. He's under arrest and under investigation. And the U.S. president says the accusations against Brett Kavanaugh were a hoax. 
This is Donald Trump hosts a special ceremony for the newest Supreme Court justice. First, though, we're learning more about that horrific limo crash in New York State that killed 20 people. We take it for granted. You leave the house in the morning, uh, and sometimes uh, you never see your loved ones again. Governor Andrew Cuomo articulating what many New Yorkers may be feeling tonight after a stretch limousine filled with friends celebrating a birthday hit another vehicle, killing everyone inside along with two pedestrians. Among those killed, four sisters, two brothers, at least three couples. The crash happening in the small town of Skoharie at an intersection with a history of collisions. Cuomo also shared this key detail in the investigation so far. That vehicle was inspected by the New York State Department of Transportation last month and failed inspection and was not supposed to be on the road. We've also learned that the limo driver himself was not properly certified. The driver didn't have the proper license to operate it, so no, it shouldn't have been on the road. Records also show that other vehicles belonging to the limo company, Prestige Limousine Chauffeur Service, have recorded safety violations five times in the last couple of years alone. Several had been ordered off the road in the past. Safety officials now hope the limo's equivalent of a black box recorder will help determine whether the 17-year-old limo was structurally sound, if its brakes were working properly. We do know that passengers texted loved ones about what they considered the limo's shoddy condition just before the crash, calling the engine noise deafening. Friends and family trying to process the magnitude of the tragedy. They were all very more active parents and involved in their children's lives. They were very smart and they were beautiful and they were, they lived life to the fullest. A candlelight vigil for the crash victims was held tonight at a popular pedestrian bridge not far from the accident site. Stretch limos have worried American safety experts for years. Stretching vehicles adds thousands of kilograms and can undermine the original safety specs. So how are they regulated here in Canada? Well, it varies by region. In Ontario, modified vehicles must be approved by the original manufacturer, like Ford or GM, and then inspected at least once a year. It's even more strict in Toronto, with mandatory inspections every six months. An urgent warning tonight from some of the world's top scientists. They say we still have a chance to limit the effects of climate change and save countless lives, but only if much more is done immediately to slow the Earth's warming. The scientists say if people around the world follow their new recommendations, there will be fewer deaths from heat, smog, and infectious diseases because there will be far fewer heat waves and floods. Sea levels won't rise as much. And most of the world's coral reefs will be saved from dying. Ron Charles looks at what needs to be done. The melting polar ice, the droughts, the mega storms. Climate scientists say they're already the results of the globe warming by one degree since the industrial age. We are seeing... The In their report today, scientists the with the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, climate, climate Change issued a dire warning that the Earth can only handle another half degree more. For different regions, for extremes, for ecosystems, livelihoods, um, it's very clear that uh, half a degree matters. Right now, as part of the 2015 Paris Agreement, countries around the world have pledged to limit overall global warming to two degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. The report's authors say that target should be kept below 1.5 degrees. Tough to do, but possible. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C implies changes on an unprecedented scale. It means deep emission reductions in all sectors. The report suggests everything from how we get around to what we eat would have to change fast. A 1.5 degree limit seems daunting, especially with climate change skeptic Donald Trump set to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement altogether. 
A Canadian author of today's report says now is the time for all governments to step up. I am hopeful, but but on the political side, I am I am less hopeful because even governments that um, sort of profess to take climate change very seriously in the end do not act according to to what is required, and this this includes Canada. Yes, we've the scientists had one more warning: if their recommendations the aren't followed, the global temperature increase could surpass 1.5 degrees as early as 2030. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. There are lots of different views on how government should deal with climate change. On Friday, we heard from Ontario Premier Doug Ford, who is in Alberta, advocating an end to the federal carbon tax. Well, tonight we'll hear a different perspective. Bob Ward is an advocate for government action to curb carbon emissions. He's at the Climate Change Research Institute with the London School of Economics, and he joined us from London. So can you give us an example of a country that's getting it right when it comes to, to trying to deal with climate change? Well, every country needs to do more. But if you look at the United Kingdom, for example, since 1990, it's reduced its annual emissions of greenhouse gases by more than 40 percent. And its economy has expanded by more than 70 percent. So it shows you can experience economic growth and reduce greenhouse gases. We've done that mainly by changing our electricity system. We've become much less dependent on coal specifically as a source of electricity. But we're also doing more in terms of energy efficiency, and that's helping householders, of course. They're now paying smaller bills than they did 10 years ago because they're saving more energy. Uh, we still have a long way to go. We're now looking at how quickly we can bring in, in electric cars. We've got a big challenge in terms of replacing our central heating systems, which run on gas, and looking at alternatives, perhaps even changing the whole system over to hydrogen. Um, and we're also looking at our diets. Uh, people are generally eating less meat because it's a healthier diet, and that's also helping with greenhouse gas emissions because red meat is a particularly wasteful form of food, involves a lot of resources to keep livestock, and that livestock emits a lot of methane, which is an even more powerful greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Now in Canada, we're seeing some politicians equate opposing a carbon tax as a way of saving money for taxpayers, which, which sounds appealing to at least some voters. Yes, but that's a falsehood because what's happening is people are paying more through the impacts of climate change. And the people who are paying are usually those who are most vulnerable in society. So you have to ask yourself, are you prepared to put that extra price on the people who experience flooding, the people who are suffering from drought, the people who are suffering from coastal flooding when there are storms? All those things are now linked to climate change. And the carbon taxes, all they do is help redistribute the costs from the people who are causing the problem, i.e. those people who are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, putting the price back on their, on their shoulders rather than the people who are dealing with the consequences. So this is really about the fairness of the system. It's simply not fair to allow people to emit greenhouse gases for free and expect everybody else to pick up the cost. Okay, Bob Ward, thanks for speaking with us. Now to a missing persons case that had the world looking for answers. Meng Hong Wei was ahead of the global police agency Interpol when he disappeared 13 days ago. But Meng was also a senior official of China's ruling Communist Party and worked for decades in China's justice system. When he took the Interpol job two years ago, some feared he might be a tool of the regime. As Sasha Petrosik tells us, he now seems more a target. It seems like something out of a mystery novel. The head of Interpol flies from France to his native China and apparently disappears amid Beijing smog and secrecy. Meng Hongwei, the face of the world police body, gone. He sends one final cell phone text to his wife, an ominous emoji of a butcher knife and a message to wait for his call. She says it never came. Back in Lyon, hiding her face, she tells reporters she's worried about her husband's safety. And for days, even the sleuths at Interpol can't find their leader. At a news conference today, a Chinese foreign ministry official confirmed Meng is being held by Beijing. Uh, Meng Hongwei is suspected of bribery and being investigated for corruption, said the spokesman. 
Meng has submitted his resignation as president of Interpol, he said. It's not the first time someone has simply vanished here. China's best-known actress, Fan Bingbing, disappeared in July, only to appear last week with an online apology and a bill for millions in unpaid taxes. She praised the Communist Party for its help. Hong Kong businessmen have been forcibly, secretly brought to mainland China to face charges. And hundreds of party officials, even top ones, have been snared in a campaign to stop corruption. Politics may also have played a role in the case of Meng, as rumors swirl in Beijing that he was associated with a group that's fallen out of favor with President Xi Jinping and China's ruling elite. Whatever the reason for Meng's detention, it must have been important to China. Beijing took pride in its presidency of Interpol for the first time ever, and now its reputation will take a hit. The way all this unfolded also highlights the nature of the justice system here, still largely cloaked in secrecy. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Beijing. Now to Washington, where a vicious political fight has culminated in this moment of triumph for Brett Kavanaugh. The Senate confirmation process was contentious and emotional. I take this office with gratitude and no bitterness. At the White House tonight, Kavanaugh referred to the sexual assault accusation against him, which delayed his confirmation and threatened to derail it. Earlier today, Trump denounced those accusations in his strongest terms yet. The things they said about him, I don't even think he ever heard of the words. It was all made up, it was fabricated, and it's a disgrace. Trump blamed the whole controversy on scheming Democrats. He said any attempt to impeach Kavanaugh would be an insult to all Americans. You gotta follow the weather, you gotta listen when they say they're to evacuate. You have gotta evacuate and don't don't wait to the last minute. Residents in the Florida Panhandle are in a race against time. They're in the path of Hurricane Michael. A state of emergency has already been declared for Florida and Alabama. The storm expected to make landfall Wednesday, and it's already slashing western Cuba. CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is watching this storm for us. And Joe, explain for us why there are particular concerns about this storm. Well, Ian, Hurricane Michael uh, is highly likely to become the strongest storm to make U.S. landfall so far this season. As it moves across the Gulf of Mexico over the next 36, 48 hours, it'll move into uh, very warm waters, much warmer than normal for this time of the year, and that will feed into what's called rapid intensification. So growing from a Category 1 to a Category 3 in just under two days, and that will make it a major hurricane upon landfall. Uh, the other big concern, as the Gulf of Mexico has shown us uh, in its historical tracks, storm surge is a big concern with these kinds of landfalling systems. They have a very shallow uh, but long coastline, and that is a big concern with this storm, Ian. You know, the last big storm to roll into the southern United States didn't quite meet the expectations of forecasters in terms of where it was and how strong it was. Uh, this one seems different, though. It's true. There is a much higher confidence in the forecast models, even uh, this early out, as far as the exact landfall, the intensity, and the timing. Now, I want to show you a series of the different forecast models. This is what we call a spaghetti plot. And you can see how they're all targeting in on that Florida panhandle. Now, there are still a few outliers. There is still some uncertainty as far as the timing uh, range between Wednesday morning and Wednesday evening. And that made uh, change exact landfall. But Ian, this is a much higher confidence than we're used to seeing this far out. Okay, Johanna, thank you. You're welcome. There's a lot more to come tonight on The National. They have entertained generations of children, sold millions of albums. We'll hear from Sharon and Bram as they prepare for their farewell tour. And it may not look like much anymore, but this is a piece of Canadian history and it's up for sale. We'll tell you why. And later we'll have an in-depth investigation into Apple. The National goes undercover to examine the tactics that can uh, make big bucks, make you spend big bucks, instead of making a simple repair. Basically, all the components that we need to replace is going to cost more than $1,000. So To fix it entirely will yeah. cost more than $1,000? Yeah. We've got an Apple, and we have a light. So it's, it's fixed? Yeah. Now that, that took you, like, one and a half minutes? Maybe. <laughs> Thank you.
do. I love you. For decades, Canadian kids and their parents have loved Sharon, Lois and Bram. That trio, trio became a duo after Lois died of cancer three years ago, but her legacy lives on through the music. Now in their 70s, Sharon and Bram love performing as much as ever. Our Tashana Reed recently caught up with them as they geared up for one last tour. They talk about love, talk about peace. When Sharon Hampson and Bram Morrison started making music 40 years ago, they had no idea they'd still be at it today. We thought that we'd make a record and uh, it would be nice. But very, very quickly it became clear that, that a career was unfolding in front of us. Zoom, zoom, zoom. My heart goes kaboom. In 1978, along with the late Lois Lilienstein, Sharon, Lois and Bram made their debut. Church, choirs, those are all mostly gone. People have the urge to put their voices together and sing together. So in absent those things, we just kind of walked in and said, okay, come with us. Their uncanny ability to connect with kids and adults took them across Canada and the U.S., even a performance at the White House. The trio sold more than three million albums and starred in their own TV shows. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hi, Shanna. At our concerts, if the kids stood up to do something, so did the parents. If they were doing, you know, whatever they did, they did together. And I think it was a rich experience, experience for families to share that. This was our 10th anniversary. Despite the ever-changing landscape of children's entertainment, the group managed to stay relevant for generations of fans. When we do our concerts, nothing has changed. They, they respond in exactly the same way. Once you pull them away from their screens. They're ready to participate and do it and be part of it. They're building guns. And now, Sharon and Bram are going on tour one last time across Canada, including a stop where it all started, at Young People's Theatre in Toronto. They established that intimate relationship with an audience and also the live connection. And I think over the years, they've maintained that sense that the audience are there with them, singing along with them. This family has shared love for their music across three generations, even at Kaylee Meehan's wedding. My father-daughter dance was just going <laughs> to uh, Because it was just something that my dad and I, it came to mind as something that we shared as, as when I was a kid. They're, they're rooted in what's good and, and uh, sort of a, a good sense of values. They're familiar and they're fun and you can be silly and it's, I think it's just nice that something that you can share all together. <laughs> And as Sharon and Bram head on the road one last time, they say they're grateful for the career they've had. If we had to identify one really key thing that we would have hoped to do, that would be bringing music into, putting music into people's lives so it's theirs forever. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, we go in-depth and undercover to investigate Apple. Are people being pressured to buy new products instead of repairing the ones they already have? This stems from a mentality that they're the center of the universe and nobody else is doing anything with their products. I'm excited to show you what is by far the most advanced iPhone we have ever created. The launch of a new iPhone is never dull, and it's hype like this that has made Apple one of the most valuable companies in the world. Its customers are fiercely loyal when it comes to computers and electronic gadgets, they tend to buy nothing else. And that's the thing, their favorite brand is now widely accused of deceptive business practices, and many of those loyal customers are feeling ripped off. Tonight, Terrence McKenna meets some of the people who are attacking the Apple empire. This is the image of an Apple store that the company wants you to see. Masses of customers hungry for the latest product. 
knowledgeable young staffers eager to serve them. A mad rush to be among the first to buy a brilliant new device. Lately, however, that positive image is being tarnished by stories of customers being wildly overcharged for repairs in Apple stores. We decided to use a hidden camera to verify many reports that Apple customers are often told their malfunctioning computers are not worth fixing, even when minor repairs could remedy the problem. How are you? I have an appointment at 2.30. Come with me. Our team came to a Toronto Apple store with a MacBook computer that had a common problem. The screen had stopped working. It's like very dim when I try to turn it on. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll jump out the back and have a look on the inside. Sure. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of liquid that's gotten on the inside. Um, so I took a little picture. Um, the little red dots here, they're normally white, and it means that they've come in contact with liquid. So for it to be basically all over the whole computer, it means that it, um, something's gone through the whole thing. Um, so with that, we'd need to be looking at replacing quite a few components. Um, are you sure it's a, could it be something else as well? Well, regardless of what the cause of it is, if it isn't the liquid, we have to fix the liquid. So it's not uh, like we can't do partial repairs when it's been damaged by something. So what are my options now? This, oh, well, what I was going to say is basically all the components that we need to replace is going to cost more than $1,000. So To fix it entirely will yeah. cost more than $1,000? Yeah. So it, the very least we'd need to replace is the logic board and the top case. So that we're looking at 600 plus 500, doing $1,100 with a labor of 100. And then if we need to replace the display as well, that's another 780. So the display we may not need to replace, but we're still looking at a total of around $1,200. Wow. So just to be clear, there's no cheaper alternative for this? Um, I mean, that, that cost is very close to the cost of buying a new computer. In terms of fixing it in the store, no. Many Apple customers have shared similar experiences, and so we decided to double check the diagnosis. On First Avenue in Manhattan, there is a small computer repair store run by Lewis Rossman. He started fixing computers in college and now makes YouTube videos teaching people how to repair complex items. Overall, Apple tries to get you to purchase a new device instead of repair your old one. His videos often draw millions of views. We brought him the computer that the Apple store in Toronto said was not worth fixing. Right, have a seat. So this is a MacBook Pro that uh, Apple, uh, the Apple store said would t it cost $1,200 to fix and wasn't worth doing. All right, let's take a look and see if that's true. See, see you can see the Apple logo there? Mm -hmm. yeah, and watch, but... if I take a light and I put it through there, you'll actually be able to see everything on the screen. So this is my microscope light. And when I put it right through here, you can see that there's a cursor there and that it's moving. So most right. of the screen is working properly. It's just that the, the backlight is not working. Right. This could be either due to a bad screen, a bad motherboard, bad cable. Uh, we'll figure that out once we open it up. Okay. All right, so let's take a look on the inside of this. Now, this is where the screen is going to connect to the computer. Okay. So the first thing I'd want to do is examine that area of it to see what it looks like. See the, see the pin that's sticking out? Okay. So that pin is actually most likely the pin for the backlight. And as you can see, it's probably not making contact because it's bent outwards. And I got my set of tweezers over here, and I'm just going to try to push that back into the slot and try to get it back into its groove so that when I re-plug in the connector, it'll work. Uh, at the Apple store, they suggested this was water damage. Well, you can see that there are water indicators that have turned red, so that's why they got that idea, and they're by the battery. So this, this is a water indicator, uh, and these, these turn red when they see liquid. However, the thing here is that these not only turn red when they see liquid, they also turn red anytime there is humidity. So if you have this in a very humid room, all of these sensors will turn, even if you've never spilled liquid on the machine. All right, so let's 
plug this back in and hope for the best. <laughs> All right. As you can see, we've got an apple and we mm -hmm. have a light. So it's it fixed. Yeah. Now that, that took you like one and a half minutes. Maybe. <laughs> So if I walked in off the street with this problem, what would you charge to, for the repair you just did? If somebody wanted me to just bend the pin back, I wouldn't charge them for that. I would say, I'm going to rework your original cable. That may not last long term, but here, it's free. If they wanted us to replace the cable, depending on the model, anywhere from 75 to 150, depending on the difficulty of opening that model. But something like this, we wouldn't charge for. And 99% of the time, just bending the pin back, it'll allow it to last until the end of the life of the computer. We asked Apple to respond to this incident. This is going to cost more than $1,000. To fix it entirely will yeah. cost more than $1,000? Yeah. And to the widespread allegations of similar corporate behavior. They declined to provide a spokesman, but issued a statement claiming their customers are best served by Apple's certified experts using genuine parts. They denied systematically overestimating repair costs. How often do people show up here with uh, the Apple store telling them it can't be fixed or it's too expensive to fix? Somewhere between 10 and 30 times a day. No kidding. Yeah. In San Luis Obispo, California, iFixit is probably the most successful third-party repair business in North America. The business tests cell phones and computers, diagnoses problems that regularly occur, and develops the tools and techniques to repair them. They sell the tools and repair manuals over the internet. iFixit has 125 employees and makes $21 million a year. The business is owned by Kyle Weens, who is also a leading spokesman for the national right to repair movement. It used to be that you, if you bought something, you'd be able to you know, get it fixed when you needed to. And over time, we've lost that ability, whether it's a vacuum or a television or a laptop. It's increasingly more challenging to get access to the information that you need or for local shops to get the parts. So right to repair is a movement and a set of legislation that would restore that ability to fix your own stuff. How does Apple fit into that question? Apple's perspective is that they want complete control over the device from the moment that you buy it all the way through the end of life. And Right to Repair uh, takes some of that control away from them and puts it in the hands of the owner. And, and that's where, for, for a manufacturer to say, we're making a product and we're putting it out in the world and we're going to control every aspect of what happens after the fact, is, is complete lunacy. We asked Kyle Weens to show us some of the tricks Apple uses to foil easy repairs starting with okay. non-standard screws. So this is the pentalobe screw. It's on the bottom of the MacBook uh, Pro, and it's, it's these little five points you can see. It's, it's not like any screw that you've seen before. And it turns out that Apple invented their own screw. It's, it's purely they want to uh, make the devices harder for normal people to open with the tools that they already have laying around. Mm -hmm. Then Apple started gluing in batteries. This is an iPhone 8, and, and this is the battery, and it's glued in, and that's unfortunate. It doesn't need to be glued in. Batteries didn't used to be glued in. Was it one of those kind of pull and release tabs? Yeah, it's a, it, it's 3M calls them command adhesive. Right. OK. There, and it broke. Hmm. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, there's your home button. On some Apple phones, the home button would have to be replaced if the screen cracked. And I can take the home button now. It was a cheap and easy repair. But then Apple reprogrammed the operating system to detect non-authorized home buttons, and the phone would suddenly stop working. Yeah, it would be like if you're driving your car and maybe you changed out the tires and you had aftermarket tires, and then all of a sudden Tesla pushes out a software update and your car stops driving because of those aftermarket tires. It, it, this stems from a mentality that they're the center of the universe and nobody else is doing anything with their products. Apple insists that its products are best serviced by its own staff and clearly sees unauthorized third-party repair businesses as the enemy. Lewis Rossman and iFixit have received legal threats from the company when they publish schematics or repair manual information. I would be happy with a rollback on the intellectual property law and the uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement law that allow people to be either thrown in jail or prosecuted for importing parts and for showing a schematic. Because Apple writes the manual, they own the copyright to it. And so if you post that manual online, they'll send you a legal takedown threat saying that's our copyrighted material. If you don't take it down, we'll sue you for up to $150,000 in 
and damages per incident. And, and those legal threats have, have really put a damper on repair information online. The tide may be turning against Apple on the right to repair issue. I just did a video of myself fixing a phone that drives they were supposed to fix. This is the New York State Legislature, where Lewis Rossman and the Right to Repair movement have set up a repair cafe to put on a show for politicians. Which one of these, one, two, or three, do you think is covering up the battery connection? Probably this one. Probably that one. So far this year, 17 U.S. states have introduced Right to Repair legislation that would force Apple and other companies to provide repair manuals and spare parts to third-party repair businesses. I'd like Apple to change by acknowledging that if they're not willing to do certain jobs, maybe somebody else would. And to just, I, I'm not even asking them to extend an olive branch. I'm just asking them to, you know, stop extending the knife. What happens when the first state actually passes one of these proposed legislation? Well, this is where it gets really interesting, is the moment that one state passes things, it's, it's, the dam is going to burst. So if Ontario decided we're going to pass right to repair legislation, that could actually pass right to repair for the world, because manufacturers aren't going to provide products differently to people in, in one jurisdiction. They want to simplify their operations. The right to repair movement has put a spotlight on some of Apple's predatory business practices. I mean, that, that cost is very close to the cost of buying a new computer. And many Apple customers are starting to wonder whether the company really has their best interest at heart. Terrence McKenna's documentary continues after the break. When we come back, Apple customers accuse the company of a sneaky policy that pressured them to buy new smartphones. It was sort of a eureka moment, uh, and that's what prompted me to really take a deep dive into our uh, performance data and see what was happening. After an incident last winter, Apple faced a fresh allegation. Customers suspected the company had a policy designed to pressure them into buying new smartphones. Here's Terrence McKenna with part two of tonight's documentary. One night last December, at the office of a Toronto software firm called Primate Labs, founder John Poole was trying to solve a mystery. His company sells an application called Geekbench that millions of customers use to analyze the performance of their cell phones and computers. His customers were complaining that their Apple iPhones were suddenly running a lot slower, and they wanted to know why. My wife just offhand mentioned that her iPhone success felt slow, and the numbers that we got out of it were significantly lower than what I'd expect from a phone like that, uh, to the point where I didn't believe it was happening. Then he noticed an anonymous post on the internet telling people, if your iPhone's slow, replace the battery. It was sort of a eureka moment, uh, and that's what prompted me to really take a deep dive into our database of uh, performance data and see what was happening. Poole plotted the performance of millions of iPhones on a graph. The performance of many phones was cut down after the latest operating system upgrade from Apple. John Poole published his findings, which amounted to a scientific accusation that Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California, was intentionally slowing down customers' phones without telling them. To his surprise, the company quickly admitted it, but insisted they were doing nothing wrong. Well, meanwhile, we're awaiting a decision to see whether Apple will face a class action lawsuit. After over it admitted to slowing down older iPhones. Older iPhones. The tech giant says it's done to save battery life. Apple's admission that it was intentionally slowing down the performance of older iPhones triggered news reports around the world. Forum Reddit complained their iPhones were running slow. It looked like a case of planned obsolescence, an effort to pressure consumers into buying new products when they didn't have to. But Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, denied it. We always focus on the user experience. So at the heart of any decision that we make is the user. There has been an international upsurge in anger from Apple customers. At this demonstration in Paris, Apple is portrayed as the evil empire, accused of tax evasion and cheating customers. France has moved to make planned obsolescence a crime and has placed Apple under formal investigation. So my father was a judge. On Apple's home turf in California, 
Canadian consumer rights lawyer Shanna Scarlett was previously part of a successful lawsuit that forced Apple to pay a $450 million fine for breaking U.S. antitrust laws. Now she has launched a class action lawsuit alleging that Apple has tricked its customers. They've actively reached in to a consumer's phone through the operating system and made what is a large change in terms of the throttling of performance without properly disclosing it to consumers. That is a, you know, a fairly uh, invasive act for a company to do. Apple declined our request for an interview. But when the Government of Canada demanded an explanation from the company at a parliamentary committee hearing in March... ...and with us today we have from Apple Canada, uh, Jacqueline Famulac. Apple Canada lawyer Jacqueline Famulac agreed to appear. The sole purpose of the software update in this case was to help customers to continue to use older iPhones with aging batteries without shutdowns, not to drive them to buy newer devices. I think that if Apple were truly interested in the, uh, the consumer's interest, maybe it could have told them that the entire problem would have been solved by a battery replacement, that it wasn't necessary to face the stark choices of throttling performance, automatic shutdowns, or buying a new phone. There was a fourth option on the table. That was just replace the battery. I don't think that Apple did anything wrong. Mr. Erskine-Smith, you have five minutes. Apple's lawyer was challenged by Toronto Liberal MP Nathan Erskine-Smith, who pointed out that Apple had issued a sort of apology for its actions. Now, you've strangely today said Apple did nothing wrong, but the issue is disclosure, and Apple apologized for non-disclosure uh, in relation to the slowed performance. So, uh, was the non-disclosure uh, intentional or inadvertent? We did not not disclose anything. We didn't have anything to not disclose. About the slowed performance of the phone, the very reason you're attending today, that you did not disclose to consumers, was that non-disclosure intentional or inadvertent? It was not intentional. Apple's admission that it did not properly disclose the slowdown is key to Shanna Scarlett's lawsuit against the company, a case that she says proves the value of consumer class actions. How are you, one person, supposed to fight against Apple? How is one person with $10 of harm supposed to fight against one of the most well-capitalized uh, companies in the entire world? It's impossible. Silicon Valley has been driving the U.S. economy for years now, but there is growing scrutiny on the questionable business practices of Apple and other star companies here, and a growing movement to make them more accountable to consumers. For The National, I'm Terrence McKenna in Cupertino, California. Our moment of the day is up next, but first we want to tell you about a story you'll see here tomorrow night. The National recently got rare access inside Myanmar. Nala Ayed shows us what's left of Rohingya villages after the massacre. Here's a look. Immediately striking as we drive north into the killing zone, the haunting hints of the raised Rohingya Muslim villages that remain. Look at that right there. What, you, what look like uh, coconut trees that have had their tops taken off. Oh, here's a few more here. And what we've been told is that those are the remnants of villages that have been burned. Wow, look at that. It is old, run down, but full of history. The farmhouse is the birthplace of the Macintosh apple, and it, along with the 5.5 hectares it sits on, is for sale. Apples have been growing on the property for more than two centuries, and while it's been abandoned for two years, the owner says it hasn't lost its charm. All of this is our moment of the day. Uh, the property has lots of potential for somebody. If they can uh, open this for the public would be ideal, you know. Or to make ciders, cider, cider press, put a cider press in the back. The building is here and sell lots of that cider. We were here for 15 years, my wife, you know, and uh, I just said I had to move. I have three brothers, they all had heart attacks, you know, and uh, they're all in the 70s. It, the problem is here, the hospital is 25 kilometers away. That's the big problem. And that's too far. I need the place for another year to want to do some work, you know. But uh, if it's sold uh, next year, perfect. Uh, 
I'm a test coach. So on this weekend of Thanksgivings and pumpkin, it's kind of nice to celebrate the apple. We've been having a fierce debate off camera about our favorite apple. I'll spare you that, but feel free to join in on Twitter. Regional differences and childhood favorites. You can certainly uh, tell us uh, what you would choose as uh, Canada's best apple, but certainly the Macintosh has the history. That is the National for October 8th. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.